you know, every day we can only focus on so many things, and if we go out there, perhaps it's worth just focusing on our A-list for a while and trying to, and trying to move forward. Okay, so um, as you know, this presentation is about programming. Yeah, it's, uh, we call it secrets, but really for me, programming is about how we produce a, a product that is going to engage, retain, and develop players. So we want them through the door, we want them to stay, we want them to commit to more, and we want them to get better. We all know that even within the space that we're talking about here, kids tennis, there are days when as a teaching pro you wake up and you go, I've got to teach those kids. <laughs> and there are other days when you wake up and you go, I get to teach those kids today. Yeah. So somewhere along the line, we know that the secret to life, health and happiness as a teaching pro, is teaching kids who are committed to the game. And for me, that's not necessarily kids who are the performance kids. But that's a kid who, I had a, parent from a, call, uh, a call from a parent once who said, we have a problem with this boy, I'll take name, um, he keeps hitting the ball against the side of the house. <laughs> that's not a problem, that's great, really. You know, that's great, perhaps. Yeah, inside the house, in the living room, while we're trying to watch TV. How do we stop it? Those are the kind of kids that we you know we kind of want to be teaching. We want kids to love the game like we love the game. And that's kind of our mission. Our mission is to create something that engages them. I'm so I'll say this, it's very controversial. But once a week tennis has to be a pathway to twice a week tennis, otherwise it's a pathway to nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. As much as we'd like to give everybody a chance. And a, and a taster, there has to be a point at which they shift to a higher level or ultimately they do give up. And we feel like you know, we've wasted a lot of energy. I think it was Sweden did a study that said most kids who come once a week have left within 20 months, even in the good programs, even with transition balls and all those kind of things. So we have to kind of understand that if we want somebody in our program that's going to stay in our program, it is going to require us to do the right things to get them to commit a little bit more. And we have to be honest with and we have to be honest with parents as well. We have to say to parents, yes, um, I do need your kids to come more than once a week. Yes, it will cost you more money, but it doesn't matter whether it's music, art, language, or sport. If you want your kids to be good at something, and that's what most parents want, not necessarily for their kids to be a professional, but their parents' role is to find the kid, the thing that, they're, that ignites their kid's passion for something. You know, my daughter's 16 now, She's not a tennis player, but we have to find the thing that makes her have a purpose, where she wants to go, and then do more of it. And that's quite important for us to remember that we explain that one as well as we can. So, as we move through this, we're just going to start with a few little big picture things. So just so you understand where I'm coming from, this is the sort of big picture of the world. The world kind of does um, kids tennis. You watch the Australian Open this year. Well, Australian Open is one of the few tournaments that actually puts their kids' tennis program logo alongside the court. I'm very happy about that because I designed it. All right, so I always feel good at this time of year. Um, so basically, these are all different programs from all around the world. Can you guess where that one's from? That's from Norway. In Oslo, um, eight times a year, they have red, orange, green tournaments. The average number of kids coming to a red tournament is 260. One sit. The federation is not involved. Guess who runs it? It's 20 passionate coaches who all want their kids to play, all sit down around a table like this before and go up, put those kids together, those kids together, those kids together, organize the entries, organize everything, run the whole thing themselves. Yeah. And then they have over another 200 plus the, the number's always over 500 in the orange and green section as well, right? So there are, there are programs going on over the world with these kind of balls and these kind of bits of equipment, but they're actually all a little bit different. And um, common trends, a lot of people have started to use these balls a little bit more in 12s, it's a big discussion. Uh, participation has become performance. All these programs started with, let's get more people playing tennis, and then, oh, actually, we can make some good players using this stuff. Uh, Competition structures have become more formalized. Not necessarily a good thing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. If it's the only thing. I remember I was sat with a woman 
um, up in Connecticut, was talking to this woman who was one of the coaches, uh, an older lady, and she said, uh, yeah, I don't really like these kids' balls stuff, I don't like all that stuff. I'm like, oh, okay, just like the idea of using yellow balls. She's like, no, it's not about that, it's about the competition. I feel like some of these kids are getting into competition too early, too serious, at a very young age, and it's spoiling their sense of fun, the whole thing. So we had a really in-depth conversation, and I left, and I said to the tennis director, that lady's got some really good stuff to say. And he said, yeah, she should have, it's Betty Blake, James is one. So, you know, somewhere along the line, there, there's some issues we have to talk about competition. And now what's been happening, there's a lot of measuring and monitoring. That's kind of like, let's go measure all the apple trees that have been in the ground for six months and predict which one's going to have the best fruit. No system yet to prove, actually, they can identify talent. In fact, I never ever use the word. Because every time you use it, the kid's effort level goes down and the parents' expectations go up. Okay is my favourite word. Kids okay. Alright. Alright. Um, a lot of times people have dumbed this down to reduce the challenge. <clears throat> We've done a lot of work recently with computer games. Do you know the average amount of time you play Call of Duty, the shooting game, before you're shot dead on the very first time you play? Seven seconds. Within seven seconds of starting this game, you're dead. The game always ends with you being killed. <laughs> Okay? You move through the levels, getting killed progressively more and more and more and more and more, meeting more, more judges and getting killed. And 92% of American kids between the age of 2 and 17 play computer games. And fundamentally, the way that most of these games operate when you move to the next level is always about challenge. You stop when you fail. Failure is not a big problem for kids. We dumb it down too much. Um, there's a lot of other things like we've ignored child development and growth, which have been an issue. Uh, there was a famous, I don't know if you remember the story of the little boy Yang Silva, whose parents moved the whole family to Paris about 15, 10, 15, 10, 10 years ago, when he was five, so he could train full time at the academy. And uh, as his dad sat there to the camera and told him how his kid was going to win at least five grand slams, the kid was sat on the floor in the background in his Spider Man pajamas playing with his GI Joe. Five year olds, five year old, seven year olds, seven year old. That's the one thing I can tell you from traveling over 82 countries in the world. Kids, kids. Yeah. They didn't have the right to be served as kids. Um, and there's still, actually, even though we have all these tools, a problem with retaining the kids. The idea of red, orange, and green creating this amazing net that was going to capture all these kids and save tennis is not as true as people pretended it is. Yeah. So, those of you that hate it, I just gave you loads of ammunition. I'm going to blow it all up in the next 45 minutes, but you know, there you go. All right. Um, there's a couple of other things I want you to remember. Your kids' program is not supposed to be Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Disneyland. I'm from a place, and I'll say this in Mississippi, it could be a very dangerous thing to say. I'm from a place where we have this game called football, which you call soccer. Now, I don't understand why you call it football, because you only kick it every 20 minutes as far as I can work it out. As far as I'm saying, you, you should call it like smash heads or chuck it or something like that. I love it, don't get me wrong. Yeah, big Steelers fan here, right? So I love it, but um, I come from that now. No kid this Christmas got a soccer ball, ran out in the street, put it down on the ground, and said, I'm going to pretend it's a spaceship. They all went out and pretended they are heroes, the same as in baseball the same as in basketball, the same as in all those things. No other sport makes up silly stuff around their sport. They create heroes. Now, I, I was on Facebook this morning at 5 a.m., which is what happens when you travel 27 hours a day before and your body clock is still in English time, okay? And we, England, Great Britain, I say Great Britain. <coughs> you know when Andy Murray wins, he's British, and when he loses, he's Scottish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had an English person who's actually born in Hungary, raised in Australia, and now is English. No, she spent most of the time in England. Win the Sydney Open this morning. Yeah. I'm wondering how many British coaches are going to post that on their Facebook page, share that with all their kids, put that in their clubhouse, and do those things. We don't do that. Today. We don't share heroes. I can bet my life. I tell you what, the scariest day I ever had in my life, I was in um, 
<coughs> Baton Rouge, and I came out of the hotel for an LSU claim. <laughs> like, hell, there's a cult in town. What's going on? It was like Harry Krishna, but just like yellow and, and purple rather than orange. <laughs> Okay. And it's also, your program is not Harry Potter in the Wonder World, you can't wait for wonder magical things happen. You have to do hard work. Yeah? And the challenges that we actually face with this program is kids, uh, kids are starting younger, but they can learn more in less time. I never say this program makes things easier, parents don't want to hear that. You can teach a kid more things in less time. It's, you can especially teach a kid to be smart. And I'd ask you in this room, how many genuinely stupid children do you teach? As a percentage. Mine's less than 1%. I don't teach stupid children. Right? You know, but you know what I mean? Tennis kids are intelligent kids. Normally they come to the court, they can work things out. They can solve imme imme immense problems. We have to make sure that we teach them in a very intelligent way. And that's part of what this program's about. Hey, you know what? The ball's going to come back one more time than it did before. You can't just smack your forehand over there, smack your forehand over there, and that's the end of the point. Have you ever played red tennis with a group of adults who can actually play? It's really hard to finish the point. Tactically, you have to become really smart really fast. There's lots of opportunities like that. Um, so that's kind of what the, 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 the sort of global picture of what this thing is all about. But that still doesn't address what we're here to talk about today, which is programming. Yeah. Now, programming starts when you really think about understanding needs. Yeah? And that means understanding the needs of um, your customer. So, first group discussion. Who's your customer? Right? And you take, well, see how, many, see how many customers you can come up with, not individual people's names. Yes. So one customer is the kid. That's not the only customer. Okay. When you're delivering this program, who are the customers that you've got to look after? Yeah. So point the table quick. You've got 45 seconds to come up with at least six. There will be prizes at the end. Go. <laughs> Sorry, the parent, right? How much time with the kid? How much time looking after the parent? 80, 20? 90, 10? 100, 0? How does that work? Right? Because last time I looked, if I was in business, the person that gives me the money is the parent. The person who will take their kid away if they're not happy is the parent. The person that could cause me the most nightmares by creating the wrong environment for the kid and spoiling all the work that I've done is the parent. And we literally like make the sign of the cross and back away as they come through the door. But we're going to talk about parents a bit later because there is, parents need your help. And part of our programming has to be, how do we look after parents? Yeah? And I do a lot of parent presentations and most of the time the parents go, Oh, thank God somebody said that. <clears throat> because they all feel the same. And they all feel like, and I, I, who's a parent in this room? Put your hand up. Right? Now, okay, you can keep your hand up if you, 100% of the time, that's my mother funny because I mentioned parents. Right? <laughs> if 100% of the time, you know what you're doing. 
If 20% of the time I know what I'm doing, I'm happy. Yeah? So they need a lot of help. All right. So what are the other ones you've got? Okay. We might be working with other clubs, with other organisations. There is a thing, there is a, there is a, a concept in marketing that's about the three personality types. The, the, have you ever heard of the carp, the sharks, and the dolphins? Okay, the carp are the victims of life. They swim around waiting to be eaten. The sharks are always hungry and believe that it's not enough and they go around grabbing everything they can, even when they're not hungry. Dolphins just understand if we make the pool bigger, there's enough for everybody. There is not a single reason for anyone in this room to be competing with anybody else in this room within tanks. We should all be working together because you know what? There's loads of kids out there. There's kids just walking on the street, there's kids in school. If we do all work together, we can massively grow the pool. Tennis club. But sometimes, so that's why we've got feeder clubs, um, community, obviously USTA, parents, and those kinds of things. So the big question is, and this is an interesting one, what is it a kid wants from being involved in your tennis program? Now very often we talk about tennis as we're selling tennis. No, we're not selling tennis. So let me give you a good example. Um, my girlfriend is a 3-5. She has a bit of a life of luxury sometimes, but actually she does work hard, but she can play kind of whenever she likes. So she can play in the mornings because she works for herself, and she can play in the evenings. Uh, she is 40, just give her age away, just don't record this bit, Todd, come, okay. Right, so she's 40, she's a 47 year old lady who plays a 3 5 though. Okay? What do you think she wants from tennis? Turn pro. <laughs> Turn pro. Turn pro, yeah, that's what I used to say. Everybody came out, you know, like 75 year old lady would come out and go, is there a 75 year old lady category in the world? Let's see if we can get her in. No, she's got no ambitions to that whatsoever. More right. social. Yeah, so the people that she plays tennis with, vitally important, yeah? Social, okay? What Exercise. else? Exercise. Exercise. So she wants to be active, keep moving, yeah? What else? Okay, sometimes competitive. She's very competitive, she's a lawyer. Yeah. Right. Honestly, like, I just open my mouth to the question and I worry.